Hello, Internet. I am Adam Kujawa, director of Malwarebytes Labs. Just when you thought the first quarter of 2017 was the worst, in comes Q2 to show it up. Between two worldwide ransomware attacks, an increase in malware distribution for numerous platforms, and pups that block security software from starting, it has been a chaotic second quarter. After all this activity, it is hard to identify what is the most important. To that end, we have released the Cybercrime Tactics and Techniques Report for Q2 2017 on the Malwarebytes Labs blog. In the meantime, we want to educate you a little more with six things you probably didn't know about WannaCry and NotPetya. Starting at number six, let's take a look at the operating systems affected by these two attacks. For WannaCry, nearly all modern operating systems were vulnerable to the SMB exploit used to spread the malware across the world. The best method of defense for this attack was to update these operating systems and close the hole WannaCry used to get in. Unfortunately, not enough systems had been patched before the attack, leading to an infection of over 230,000 systems. In an unexpected and somewhat ironic turn, users of Windows XP were not vulnerable to the SMB exploit used by WannaCry. But before you celebrate too much about your choice to never upgrade to anything developed after 2001, remember that Windows XP is not officially supported by Microsoft. In addition to that, many of the features found in modern operating systems that make them more secure are missing from Windows XP. And while XP users might have been safe from the SMB exploit and therefore the worm functionality of WannaCry, the actual ransomware component for both WannaCry and NotPetya will infect all modern Windows operating systems. This goes to show that being safe from one attack doesn't guarantee you'll be safe from all of them. Moving on to number five, let's talk about WannaCry's kill switch. As I hinted at before, WannaCry was not your average ransomware. In fact, it was ransomware armed with worm functionality. The worm aspect would identify vulnerable SMB ports and spread to every connected system using numerous exploits. Once the worm infected a system, it would install the ransomware. The worm also included what the industry is calling a kill switch. Once the worm found a vulnerable host and installed itself, it would beacon out to a web address that was supposed to be unresponsive. If the web address responded to the beacon, the worm would not install the ransomware functionality. Now to clarify, kill switches are not common. WannaCry's might have been left over from testing during development. It was a surprisingly rookie move to make for such dangerous software. Most malware will infect a system and reach out to a command and control server. The malware would send information about the infected system, or in the case of ransomware, encryption keys to this server. It would then wait for a response as to what to do next. In the case of WannaCry, a security researcher known as Malware Tech Blog realized the purpose of the beacon and registered the domain so it would respond. In doing so, all new infections would receive a response from the web address and fail to spread any further. At number four, let's talk about not Petia's past. You may not have realized that Petia, the malware used in the second biggest attack of the quarter, is actually over a year old. To clarify, back in mid-2016, numerous ransomware families were developed by the same creator, the first one being Petia. Petia was ransomware that would disrupt your system's ability to boot into Windows, encrypt your files, and of course, demand ransom. The modern version is actually very different. It includes the ability to utilize leaked exploits, steal user credentials, and laterally move throughout a network similar to a worm. Since this was such a far departure from the original Petia, a lot of security researchers, including us, started calling it something else. Kaspersky called it not Petia, and we call it Eternal Petia. Regardless of the naming, it was pretty obvious that Original Petia and Eternal Petia were not developed by the same person or group, and after more analysis, it looked like someone just took a sample of Petia and modified it. The creator of the original Petia actually started posting on Twitter during the attack, after a long silence. After some jabs and teasing of security researchers, they decided to release the master keys for all versions of their ransomware. These keys have been deployed in decryption tools, so if you happen to still have files encrypted by Petia, Misha, or GoldenEye ransomware, you can get those files back now. We will put a link in the description to download the decryptor. Let's talk about one of the biggest headaches of the WannaCry attack for number three, the original infection vector. As we mentioned before, WannaCry was a serious and expansive attack on vulnerable Windows systems, most of them belonging to businesses. It moved quickly and didn't seem to follow any pattern. Many researchers and journalists thought it was a targeted attack on certain parts of the world, but that soon turned out to be false. 
After a few days, the Taliban infected systems was over 230,000 in at least 150 different countries. Its ability to spread faster than any malware we had ever seen had us all scratching our heads about how it was able to breach so many networks so fast. We all knew that it used the SMB exploit Eternal Blue to spread throughout networks once at least one system was infected. However, how it got on that one system was a mystery. Many researchers thought it might have been from a massive malicious email campaign, which makes sense because most ransomware today is distributed through email. However, for so many systems in so many countries to be infected at about the same time from an email campaign meant that these emails had to be the most sophisticated and well-crafted attacks that had ever existed or it wasn't actually email. Despite that red flag, we all searched for this mystery email that was supposed to be all over the world, but nobody could find it. We found a lot of malicious spam emails, but they weren't overly sophisticated, and the malware they dropped was not WannaCry. In comes Jaff Ransomware. Jaff is a relatively young ransomware family that, at least for a short period in mid-May, was the chosen payload of one of the largest spammer botnets in the world. On May 11th, a massive 5 million emails per hour attack campaign started with the attacks resulting in a Jaff ransomware infection. This campaign lasted well into the 12th, which is when WannaCry struck. While we were all looking for the WannaCry attack email, we were flooded with malicious spam pushing Jaff. Here at Malwarebytes, we determined pretty quickly that email could not have been the original infection vector. After some additional analysis and considerations, we realized that the same worm that was spreading the malware throughout compromised networks was also scanning the internet for outward-facing, vulnerable SMB ports. Once the worm found a vulnerable port, it would launch the exploit and infect the entire network. The answer was right in front of our eyes, and the reason we didn't see it sooner was because the idea that millions of unpatched, outdated systems had SMB ports open to the internet seemed far-fetched. Unfortunately, that is how it happened, and there are still hundreds of thousands of vulnerable systems open to the internet even two months later. Moving on to NotPetya, the same thing happened again, except this time we didn't linger on the wrong conclusion for very long. Many security researchers thought NotPetya might have been spreading in the same way WannaCry did, since at first there didn't seem to be a trend on where the infections were happening. The reality was even more out there than a worm scanning the internet. After a little time, it was obvious that Ukraine was a big target, and shortly after that, it was suspected that a software update for a popular Ukrainian accounting software might have been carrying the NotPetya infection with it. This is the consensus as to how the malware originally infected systems. The irony at this point is crushing. For years before this quarter, the security industry has always recommended updating systems to keep them safe from exploits. When the WannaCry attack happened, it proved our point. Updating could have saved you from the infection, and right after the attack, we pushed the importance of updating more than ever. A month later, a new attack somewhat like WannaCry utilized an updating process of popular software to spread malware. Regardless, once the infection occurs, NotPetya utilized the methods we spoke about earlier to spread throughout the victim network, encrypting and potentially destroying important documents. The use of an update process to spread malware could potentially be a clue as to who was behind the attack. This leads us to our number two thing, attribution. People love attribution. It feels good to know who launched an attack over the internet, who to blame, who to prosecute. In many cases, researchers, politicians, and of course the media will jump to conclusions as to the identity of the attackers for these large-scale incidents. Often they point the finger at governments, organized crime, activist groups, and well-known cybercriminals. In many cases, at least one of those options is likely correct. As we mentioned, identifying the bad guy is very satisfying, but unfortunately being able to do that is tough. This is because hiding online is very easy. There are numerous resources available, many of them for free, to hide your identity online. Virtual private networks obfuscate your location, proxy servers make it difficult to track what you do online, anonymous communication tools allow you to say what you want without giving away your identity, and using untraceable email accounts, decentralized digital currency, and bulletproof hosting make it possible to do business online while completely hidden. These things, especially when used together by someone who knows what they are doing, expose one very unfortunate truth. Attribution is almost impossible. We'll say it again. Attribution is almost impossible. Why do we say almost? Because most cases where someone is arrested and prosecuted for cybercrime happens because that criminal made a huge mistake and got themselves caught. 
Here is a list of ways cyber criminals have actually been caught. Some of these are hard to avoid, such as falling for law enforcement traps or being informed on. Others are easy to avoid, like not anonymizing your activities, bragging to the public, or having too many friends know what you're up to and telling other people about it. Point is, it feels great to know who caused such distress after a cyber attack. But more than likely, we will never know who they are or why they are doing it unless they come out and tell us or make one of the mistakes listed here. The unknown is scary, and while attribution creates some sense of comfort, false attribution can be incredibly harmful. It can lead to hive mind thinking and cause a lot of confusion and misinformation to be spread. Finally, at number one, we want to tell you about what these attacks mean for the future. WannaCry and NotPetya represent the dawn of a new era in cybercrime. With an increase in leaks of dangerous exploits, you can guarantee that we're going to see at least one more massive attack in the next three months that either can't be stopped or can't be protected against. In addition to that, if you didn't already think ransomware was a big deal, WannaCry and NotPetya just made every criminal in the world want to start ransoming files. This is reflected in our own stats of how much ransomware is being distributed by the criminals. And last month, it was the highest it has ever been. Does this mean that we are doomed for a worldwide disaster that will send us spiraling into the apocalypse? Nah. The benefit of these attacks is if you didn't think ransomware was a big deal before, it is very much a big deal now and lots more people know about it. Education is key. Being able to identify malware, how to avoid it, and stop it are something every person using a computer should be able to do. Be prepared for the next big attack. Utilize off-site and online backups and keep your cloud data secure with multi-factor authentication. Deploy security software that has multi-vector protection, meaning it guards your system at different points. Utilizing things like anti-ransomware, anomaly detection, and anti-exploit technologies. Don't settle for just one layer of defense. Always be learning. Find out about the latest attacks, seek the truth, and look past the hype to find out how to be safe and share that information with everyone. Finally, fight back. This doesn't mean go and try to hack professional cyber criminals from your laptop in your kitchen. Realize that the best way you can protect other people and slow down the growth of cybercrime is to protect yourself. Numerous networks were compromised by NotPetya and WannaCry because of one vulnerable infected system. Don't be that guy. Well, that is it for our list. If you want to find out more about what we talked about and then some, please check out the latest Cybercrime Tactics and Techniques report. You can find a link for it in the description. We work really hard each quarter to compile analysis, stories, security tips, and general knowledge into one document so you can stay informed without having to constantly read blogs and news sites. And the best part is, we hand it out for free. This quarter, we cover the following topics and top it off with a profile of one of our researchers. We like doing the profiles. It gives you an idea of what people who fight malware for a living are like. We can be a bit weird. Anyway, if you want to see more videos like this, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so when we make more videos, you're the first to know. Please check out the Malwarebytes Labs blog for the latest in cybersecurity news. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.